Welcome to Death and Aliens, an in-depth look at horror and sci-fi TV from two friends who vaguely know what they're doing. I'm MK. And I'm Courtney. And um, this week was so long. Like, so long. Literally, my sister asked me yesterday what my week was like, and I didn't remember Tuesday. This has been a long week. On Sunday, I had the worst anxiety of my entire life because for those of you who uh, care, the AFC divisional round football game was the worst day, worst few hours of my life. The worst 13 seconds of my life, let's be real. I forgot that happened this week. (sighs) You're right. It's been an extra long week. (laughs) Right. Then on Monday, I went to my basketball boys at my middle school and said, if you guys lose this game and I have to watch teams lose twice in a row, I can't be your teacher anymore. Don't worry. They won the game because they love me. Excellent. So you should have threatened them every week. That's what I'm hearing. Apparently, because then on Friday, they did not win their game at all. Like, not even a little bit. But I would never threaten them because they tried so fucking hard. Yeah. I was talking to one of the kids' moms who she's, she's one of my favorite parents and her and I sit together at the games. I was talking to her and I was like, "Um, I have been rooting for this team. Like they are a, a professional basketball team and B I birthed every single one of them. Which is not possible. That's a lot. It it is a lot because they're all the same age, (laughs) (laughs) but um, also, yeah, I just, I, Ooh, um, on Wednesday, I had a kid black out during mass and have the paramedics called to the school. Jeez. He is perfectly fine. He was dehydrated. Good. Um, yeah, it's just been the longest week. And I figured out the reason I can't remember Tuesday is because nothing crazy happened on Tuesday. It was just a normal day. It was just a day. My mom, I came home from work after rehearsal. My mom and I cooked dinner. I ate dinner. Like nothing insane happened. So nothing re- was retained in my head. Right, right. Well, uh, Tuesday was the only day I did anything. Oh, other good. Than work. Um, I went and saw MJ, the musical on Battle. How, how was it? <sighs> was it because i've heard nothing about it right neither i was so nervous i had no idea what i was getting into for everyone that's interested it is basically the rehearsal and setup leading up to the dangerous tour is what the show is about and with flashbacks of his childhood and like where he started with jackson five nice um i had no idea what i was getting into it was amazing the guy who played michael sounded just like him dancing skills off the charts like do you have a name uh, yep he has a name do you have his name yep it is like a foot away from me give me two seconds and i will tell you his name Um, Miles Frost. I do not know him. He, uh, da, 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 da. he was on All In. He was in the Netflix show Family Reunion. Oh, he was on The Voice. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I just looked at MJ's website and I know zero of the people in the cast. Yeah. Which does not mean they're not talented. It just means I don't know them. Well, I knew, um, so Whitney Basher was on Manifest. Oh, uh, okay. And she plays the watch that. It's really good. I haven't finished it, but it's really good. And the little kid who, uh, da, 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 I've lost him. He's on uh, Single Parents. Did you watch that show? No. Devin and Trey Campbell. He was on, on Single Parents. And, um, All right. Loved that show. So I knew a couple of people like from seeing them on TV. But uh, 
Otherwise, I did not recognize the rest of the cast or I've not seen them in anything else. Um, but it was fantastic. It was longer than I expected because I didn't know what to expect. Right. Um, but I like there was never a dull moment. Good. So. Yeah, yeah. I figured out I have to go to New York sometime this month. This I literally- month? Yeah, I I know, I know. But like I don't I don't really have time, but I need to just even if it's for like a night. Because sure. the woman in black at the McKittrick is closing. Oh, I haven't seen that yet, but I've heard that it's really good. The woman in black is I saw it in London in its original production. Mm-hmm. Well, and by original, I mean it had been it was the original production. It's the longest running show in London. It, oh, wow. it, it, it had been like on for like 40 years by the time I saw it. But then they re they changed it up to do it at the McKittrick because obviously the McKittrick is a right, right. super specific space. Mm-hmm. And, ooh, I just smacked my microphone. And I really, really wanted to see it. And then COVID. And then when they announced that it was reopening, I got so excited that it was going to be open again. But then I got an email from the McKittrick this week that they had to set a closing date, uh, which probably has to do with the company, like the rights to the show and the cast and whatever, because it's not theirs. Like they don't own it. Yeah. So it closes February 28th. And that means that I need to go to New York in February or else I don't get to see it. Well, I will be here. I have a bed and a couch. You are welcome to stay on. Fantastic. And, um, if you plan it for a night I'm not working, or if you plan it far enough advance that I can take off for work, I will go with you. Because I also Basically, wanna- I need my boss at Shays to send me my schedule for February ASAP so I can figure out what weekend I don't work so that I can literally like leave school on Friday. Except for that I'm always already going to Florida for my win- midwinter. Florida? For my midwinter break. Um, so like President's Day weekend. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I can't really afford two vacations in a month. But like, if you can get to me. Unless I'm, so I'm driving to Florida. Right. And I don't really have set plans when I'm there. I'm just going to see my family and my friends in Frozen. Mm-hmm. So if I just drive from florida to new york for the last like day of my vacation and stay there and then drive home that way that could work i would be down are you going like over the weekend are you going like into the week i'm going i'm going for like my my vacation is like a whole nine days oh i have i'm leaving from work on February 18th, and then I don't have to be back at work until the 28th. Okay. So, I don't know. Club on Sunday. <laughs> the What's 20th that? or whatever. I have book club on Sunday, well, like the 20th or whatever. Other yeah. than that, I'm free. <laughs> Perfect. I probably would not want to see the show on Sunday because then I'd have to drive back to work. So, I'd probably need to see it on Saturday. I usually work Saturday night, but I will I will request off if you give me give me a day and a time. I will look at the tickets because if they're hella and a price, <laughs> yes, you also have to give me a price. That's also important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, anything crazy about your week other than MJ? I'm freezing. <laughs> what is um, the temperature there? It's like 14 or something. I've lost my phone. I've lost everything I own. Um, it's like 14 degrees, but it feels like negative one. Oh, it feels like negative two here. Oh, we're so close. <laughs> and there's snow everywhere, um, which is fine. I love snow. Um, but I have to work tonight. I got called into work tonight and uh, not looking forward to trudging through the snow at five o'clock. So yeah, no, I don't, I don't blame you on that. That's my only problem with snow ever is when I have to work. Right. Right. And normally I like, I wouldn't mind if it was like yesterday was our big snow day and today it's like almost gone. And now I'm going to work. Like that's fine. But no, like today is the big snow day and um, we're not going to have any customers. We're not going to have anything happening um, at all. So I'm going to go there 
in the middle of a snowstorm and not make money. Yay. Yeah. Thrilled. Thrilled. Um, speaking of thrilled. Yeah. Yeah. Dead like me. Yeah. That's a thing. That's a thing that we talk about sometimes. Um, we watched season two, episode seven, Rites of Passage. Um, it was rated 8.3 stars, which is tied for the highest this season. Um, it came out on September 5th, 2004. Unfortunately, the top song and the top movie have not changed since last week. It is still Lean Back and Hero. Um, the It was written, or I'm sorry, it was directed by James Whitmore Jr., who is returning, and written by Stephen Godshaw and Carl Gajdusik, which who are also returning. Um, the guest star was a guy named Eddie Mills. He played Kyle, the uh, mm-hmm. rock star. Um, he does not have a lot of credits, but I've seen like everything he's been in. Okay. Like, he looks mildly familiar. He was on a couple episodes of The Clueless, the TV show, not the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, he was uh, a recurring character on Devious Maids. He was a recurring character on Dawson's Creek. Like, um, just. He, right. plays, he plays a pretty boy and disappears a lot. Gotcha. So Which, I haven't seen anything he's on. At least not that I, I don't know. I didn't see it. Right. Right. Um, but also he can't sing. So I don't know why he was cast as the rock star. Cause I was vaguely upset with all of the singing in this episode. Yeah. Um, he was much too average yeah. to be considered right. a huge rock star. And like, if that's your stick, you lean into it. But it wasn't like he leaned into being super average, like for no. his persona. It was like Justin Bieber level phenomena with like the a Chris Kirkpatrick voice. Right. And like the guy next door. Yeah. It's like they just found someone off the street and were like, now you're a rock star and you don't have to change anything about your life. And he's like, cool. I'll show up in jeans and a t-shirt and see what happens. Right. Um, the, uh, the description says the others are jealous when George, uh, draws a VIPR, which I then learned they could say Viper, uh, yes. Daisy, Daisy restores a cynical priest's faith and Reggie visits the scene of her sister's death. Yep. So Correct. A lot happening in this episode. Um, we start with George appearing to be on a date but then, just kidding, she wasn't on a date. She was just stargazing with the guy that she just reaped after he overdosed of dope in his car. And this scene <laughs> feels very like the intro to Third Rock from the Sun. Yeah, it did. I was like, it, like, it almost seemed like shot for shot. I did not look anything up, so I don't know. Well, if there was no trivia on the episode, so if it was, nobody caught it until you did. Well, I do know everything better than everyone else so (laughs) yeah i'm probably right that is probably the title of this episode (laughs) well you know (laughs) um then we cut to joy being woken up terrified by sounds around the house that she doesn't know where they came from so she wakes reggie up and tries to escape the house in their bathrobes but LOL JK, it's just Grandma Phyllis on the roof with some hot guy named Hank checking out the roof. Because that's the most normal thing to wake up to. I mean, Phyllis, normal is not a word I will ever use to describe that woman. No, absolutely not. Um, We go into the house where um, Joy is fighting with her mother still about this roof endeavor, and then Phyllis goes on quite a long diatribe about men with nice asses. Yep. And that was the first moment I realized I am George's grandma. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. (laughs) There was a lot of times where I was like, oh, God, I'm this woman is me. (laughs) Well, at least you know what to look forward to in like 40 years. Fantastic. I can't wait. Her outfits, yeah. so good. Maybe don't leave your children, though. 
probably. I mean, I'd have to have children first. I mean, yeah. But. <laughs> um, we go to Dare Waffle House, where Daisy is reading the Bible to everyone at the table. Um, to which Mason and Roxy have many complaints. So and- this part was so funny to me because um, so the woman who used to work in copyright, the position I'm in now, yeah. um, she was like holy ro- roller Jesus fan, like real, real into Jesus, which is fine. Jesus is cool. But I'm all about that. Right. But she would like all day long. She was just like constantly saying prayers constantly tell it like quoting bible verses to like sarah and christina and she would always read her bible on lunch and then tell them about it and i was just like daisy you gotta back it up a bit you are this is this is too much it's perfectly fine to be in love with jesus it is a whole different thing to just like well all the time. true but i had so many emotions during this scene that i don't think i was meant to really have because mm-hmm. daisy was like Moses didn't die because of death. God kissed him. Like, isn't that the most beautiful way to go? Which, of course, makes perfect sense to all of these people who are, like, struggling with the fact that they died, but they're not really dead. And then Rube was like, doesn't it, did you get to the part yet where it talks about how God hates death and there's no place in heaven for any of us? And I was like, that is painful. I know. Like, to Daisy and to also to me who loves Jesus and is very invested in these characters. Yeah, I uh, I just put wow, Rube. That's kind of harsh. Like, so unnecessary. Um, Rube is a little salty in this episode in general. Mm-hmm. Um, it happens. Rube has off days. It is what it is. Um, so he passes out post its, and everyone immediately goes bananas because uh. George gets this fancy envelope that's supposed to like automatically be able to be recognized as the fact that it is a viper or a very important person reap. That is when you have to reap the soul of a celebrity. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we go into a really funny moment where uh, Daisy is talking about her first very important reap and how she reaped James Dean. And Mason's like, oh, did he try to hit on you? And she's like, no, and I don't know why. And Rube just goes, I do. <laughs> ah, I thought that was also Which very then also made me spiral into a 20-minute like search on all of the most recent articles on where people stand on James Dean's sexuality. So there's that. <laughs> because a lot of people like to say that he was gay. But he was solidly bisexual. Yes. Because he had very, very intense relationships with both men and women. Like, if he wasn't bisexual, the woman that he was engaged to, ne- that would never would have happened. He never would have, like, right. been as committed to her. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But also, that was a time when that was not a thing that you said or did. Right. You're not allowed to. Which, of course, then also went into me reading all of the, like, intense... uh like articles about how rebel without a cause showed a gay relationship without showing a gay relationship. And like, I was solidly spiraling into James Dean's sexuality for unnecessarily long after that, because I just laughed so hard at Rube. I just, his life and death are fascinating. So fascinating. What a man. I had a t-shirt when I was 12 that said Mrs. Dean with just a picture of his face. There was a, was it Hillary Duff did a song called Mrs. James Dean? Yep, she sure did. It was a great song. Very <laughs> much enjoyed it. What a time to be alive. <laughs> um, so then they get their, their jobs. They're all pissed off. Um, but Rube pulls Roxy aside and is like, you need to help the church. And Roxy's like, fuck that shit. And he's like, not as like a reaper, as a cop. And she's like, you want me to lose my job? And he's basically like, fuck your job as a cop. Your job is a reaper. And whether you want to be a reaper or not, that's the job you can't lose. Right. So help help your friend. Which, like, 
is true, but there's probably a better way to go around it. Like, yeah, but I think Roxy and Rube have the kind of relationship where he can basically be like, fuck your noise. And she will, she, cause she was, she was like, what if I say no? He's like, say no. So she does. But then obviously she doesn't cause she then goes and helps George. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like that's the relationship they have. So I appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. Um, then we go back to the last house where we realize that Joy makes a lot more sense as a character when you meet her mother. Yeah, she is uh, the way she is for a reason. Because if you had a free spirited, totally unable to focus, unable to settle mom, like some people do that and are also still good, like caring parents, but like her mom clearly was not a present parent. Mm -hmm. So obviously like rebellion from that would be to become the most uptight stick in the mud person in the world. Right. Because it's everything her mom wasn't. Which also- And we know like from other episodes that Joy's not always like that either. She like does enjoy a glass of wine and she does want to have fun, but she's so- scared to I guess go off the deep end that she ends up staying so straight all the time well and also she the only times we see her being really completely overbearing is in family relationships but Mm -hmm. it's because she never learned how to do that and she had such an absent mom that to be present she has to be over present right um that's the same relationship of all of these parents have become helicopter moms because of all of the parents who had latchkey kids from the 80s. It's the same yeah, progression. It is. But I also feel, I feel some type of way about that because I know that it doesn't have to be that cycle because yeah. like my parents came from rather broken homes. Mm-hmm. And then consciously made the decision to never put that on us. Right. So, like, it, it's possible to do that. But you have to consciously be aware of flaws in your makeup and choose right. to not do that. Which most people don't. And that's why everyone should go to therapy. Everyone needs therapy. Set coming from someone who has not gone to therapy in a very long time. Same. <laughs> it's fine. Doesn't I mean I believe. don't, I still totally believe in it and I still am aware that I probably should have it. Yes. Um, I don't actually remember what their particular fight was about in this moment. I think this was whenever she was talking about, uh, was this when she was like doing incense energy. all over the house? This is when she wanted Reggie to, like, cope with grief and do all of these things. And Phyllis was talking about it. (laughs) The only reason I know that is because she put, she said, she's not old enough to deal with this. She's 11. And I was like, she's been 11 for, like, two years. Like, wasn't she 11 before George died? No, she was 10 before George died. Okay. She was 10 when George died. And so it's only been one year since George's death. It hasn't See, I thought she was 11. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. I was like, she's been no. 11 forever. No, first episode, she was 10. Gotcha. It's, gotcha. it's because Britt McPhillips, who plays Reggie, doesn't actually look 10. Yes. But, yes. yeah. So they're fighting about Reggie's coping mechanisms. Then we go to where? Happy time. Oh, yes. Sorry. Because my note says Misty is a psycho. And then I couldn't remember who Misty was. <laughs> yes. We go to Happy Time where George is trying to figure out how to get into this Kyle concert that she needs to go to to rape this famous singer man. And turns out some weird fucking chick at her office is obsessed with him and has a tattoo of him on her chest. And she takes her shirt off to show George. In the middle of the office. Just like casually. Um, George is trying to re-zipper this woman's shirt because she is uncomfortable when Dolores appears. (laughs) 
And the next scene with Dolores also made me feel some type of way. Like, this scene was like, this whole episode was like, let's specifically target your very, very niche insecurities. <laughs> um, because then Dolores gets uncomfortable and runs away and goes to her desk where you see that she is on a dating app and no one has messaged her on the dating app. And George comes over and she's like, I'm not a lesbian. <laughs> And Dolores is like, listen, when you're young and pretty, life is a buffet and you are a fat man with a fork. Oh, goodness. But then you get older and it's really hard to find a fork. And I was like. (sighs) So basically, Dolores is like, I was in college once. I did those things. And I was like, okay, more more, more things that Dolores. we've learned about Dolores that make me uncomfortable with her existence as a human. Mm-hmm. Because we now know that she has screwed homeless people for fun, um, experimented with her sexuality in college, um, done crack. Mm-hmm. Uh, what did she say? Something about like going to jail or robbing someone? Like That was something that came up at one point. What? She... She I has lived. Dolores has lived a life. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and I kind of loved her a little bit in that moment because uh, George is like, I have to leave early. And she's like, do you have another doctor's appointment? And George's like, no. She's like, do you have an AA meeting? And George's like, no. She's like, why do you need to leave? George just goes, fuck it. I'm going to tell the truth this time. A rock concert. And she was like, you go get that buffet. I was like, why have all the time are you telling the truth now, George? I was like... Listen, there was a lot of unnecessary telling of the truth in this episode. Oh my gosh, so much. So much. So much. Um, <sighs> so then, George is still trying to figure out how the fuck to get to this concert when who should appear but Guardian Angel Mason, who's like, hey, Roxy is downstairs in her police car. We are getting you to the concert. Fantastic. Not one person questioned that Mason walked in out of nowhere. They have a lot of traffic in that office that doesn't make sense. Like, anytime somebody comes to talk to George, they just walk up in. I think, but here's here's the thing. It's a temp office, so they probably have a fairly rotating staff. Also, <laughs> Crystal is the receptionist. Mm-hmm. And Crystal has had her, our late night shenanigans with the Reaper team and probably is very much like, fuck it, go ahead. Fair, fair. So I'm less worried about it now than I was at the beginning. Yes, that makes sense. I didn't even think about it. <laughs> kind of lets people through, so. Yeah. Um, so then we go back to the last house where uh, Phyllis is like, you know what, Reggie? We're not going to go to school today. Because... Phyllis is separated enough from the situation to understand that Reggie doesn't feel like she can talk to her mom and she needs someone to help her process her grief. Mm -hmm. And when you are a crazy incense burning spirit talking old lady, you're the perfect person to help someone process their grief. Absolutely. That's who I'd call. Yeah. Um, Then we go back to George um, where Roxy is trying to find George an outfit to wear to this concert, and Roxy hates all of George's clothes, and Mason is um, going on and on about like riding in police cars and how he reached Charlton Heston, and we were and Roxy was like, "Dude, Charlton Heston's not dead." He was like, "Yeah, but like he could be." <laughs> what? <laughs> Ah, I know. Mason. And so so Roxy finally is like, you know what? Fuck it, Mason. You are too much. I'm done with you. You stay here. George and I are going to buy her clothes that make her look sexy enough to go to this concert. But one other thing they said, uh, George started asking about, she was like, do you think that uh, Baruch has ever reached any famous people? And they're like, oh, yeah, probably loads. And then I was thinking, yeah, it was Mason. It was Mason. Rube is so old. He reached Jesus. And I was just like, well, and here's the thing. 
while I know that Rube did not rape Jesus. Right. My question is, did someone? But because no, in, in this universe, in this universe where the reapers exist, they talk about how death didn't exist until the toad broke the vase. And now reapers exist because of that. So when Jesus died, obviously God works his things and brought Jesus back. But like when Jesus died on the cross, did someone rape him? And like, would it be the same if you come back though? I don't know. Unless <laughs> Jesus is a reaper. No, but he looked the same when he came back. So all these people, because like none of them use any of their other characters in ages. Yeah, but we do know that they still don't look like them. I think that storyline is just by the wayside. I think that's a terrible argument. <laughs> I mean, um, the Reaper. All right. But then he couldn't go to heaven. Because Rube just said that the Reapers don't. I don't know. I don't. The Bible was written by man. Everything in there is like, you know, you have to. Maybe it was translated incorrectly. <laughs> so then we go to Daisy. And she's at church. And um, she is talking to the priest that she went to confession with because um, he is her next rape victim. But he is a drunk shit show. <coughs> and and um, fulfilling the role of a creepy priest. But like, yes. At first. And then at first. Could. But he's like, he's also like, she's like, um, father, that's a little messed up. And he's like, no, listen, I'm drunk. I am covetous. I'm not that bad. Yeah. Like, Because he's basically like, do I think you're attractive? Yes. Am I going to give up my vows as a priest? No. Even though right now I would really like to. Right. And I was like, you know, human beings in, are, are fallible. Sin. It happens. I don't think that any human is completely incapable of covetousness. Like that's mm -hmm. one of the big ones for a reason. So like good on him for being like, these are my flaws. Again, right. therapy for everyone. Everyone. But instead of sending him to therapy, Daisy does the most bizarre thing. And she's like, this priest needs to believe in Jesus again. So I will show him a miracle. By stabbing myself and letting him see me heal. I don't know why. Why do we need to keep telling people about things? That's, that's not the rules. <sighs> then we go to the concert where Mason is trying to sneak in. Because fun fact, Mason needs to get in too because his reap is also there. But the uh, bouncers will not let him in because he is a scumbag. Right. And then Roxy arrives with George and Mason's like, oh, thank God, Roxy. And she's like, sir, get out of my way. And he's <laughs> like, he's like, Roxy, if you continue to not pretend you don't know me, this will not be the end of you. Like, I will continue to make you hear about it. And she said, don't I know it? <laughs> But she, in fact, does not help him in. Right. She uh, sends George in her new sexy outfit, which <laughs> that outfit. <laughs> I know it has been a while since 2004. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I probably thought that outfit was nice in 2004. No. Not anymore. Absolutely not. The early 2000s were the worst fashion time in the history of mankind. I loved it. Victorian bustles are sexier than what people wore in the 2000s. <laughs> and this comes from someone who was solidly a teenager in the 2000s and dressed like that. Right. No, right. no. I take it back. I take it all back. <laughs> I don't think that's like quite how it works. <sighs> I wish it was. I know. Um, so then George goes inside and she meets Janine and they're talking about 
why they're there. She's making friends so she can blend in. And my favorite part was she said, I need a job that says I'm supposed to be here, but I don't have to do any work. So she says, every day. she says, I'm an intern. Yes. And I was like, while I appreciate it in that moment, I will say the most work I have ever done in my entire life was when I was an unpaid intern. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, like if you think about it, like if you're an intern at like a TV station and she's just like, part of her job is just to go and view it. She doesn't have to work. But, like maybe she does other work elsewhere. Right. Um, also that conversation, like, I don't know if it was written down in the script, but it sure didn't feel like it. Like it was so choppy listening to Janine and George try to have a conversation and they weren't even drunk yet. Right. And I was just like, the the other thing is they did a weird thing with the monologues this episode, Mm -hmm. like where the monologues were part of the conversation yeah. like you would hear george's thoughts and then sometimes she would say them out loud and sometimes she wouldn't and they did that in this episode and the next one and i was like where did this come from i feel like this is one of my generic thoughts about these next couple of episodes um i feel like they decided they were gonna try and remake the show before it was over and figure out a way to rewrite it differently because they thought maybe they were going to have a third season because they added in Phyllis, who I think was a better dynamic than Clancy, but it's way too late in the game to add her in. If, they, if they're going to make her as prominent of a character as they're acting like they are. And then they I don't, like, I don't see her as staying though. I see her as an arc for the yeah. a couple episodes, which is fine in that case. Like it, it works. It does, but it's just, she seems like, they've made her such a bigger part and to put her in more than one episode so far just seems like if they're going to continue doing this, it seems like they would have preferred her to Clancy. I agree. I think she would have been better if they put her in episode one. Yeah. I see. I don't feel the same way about that. I feel like, cause I feel like in a lot of long running shows, you have characters that come in for a couple episodes and like you have arcs that happen and like people who are really plot devices like Phyllis as great as she is as funny as she is she is a plot device for Joy and Reggie actually coming over the hurdle yeah you know what I mean so if she's only in two or three episodes fine if they then want to put her in for the entire rest of the season that's when it becomes like okay this was the wrong time right and I I do agree about that I think because they're changing so many other things yeah. right now. That's where it becomes such a problem because it feels like it feels like a different show this episode. And like it's, you know, it has a lot of the same qualities, but like the characters, some so of them are having different personalities and there like, are one of two things happening. They're either trying to revamp the show in hopes of twe- tweaking it just enough to get renewed mm-hmm. or they're realizing that they're not going to get renewed and they're trying to change it up enough that making an ending happen faster doesn't feel weird. Yeah, I just, I think it's probably more the, my guess is that it's more the first right. one because right. I, yeah, I don't really knew elements before they were to end it. Right. Well, but that's, that's what I'm saying. I don't know no. which one it was. I don't know when they found out that they were canceled, but those are the two things that I think could. T- a mid season two like revamp of the show means one of those two things. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know. Um, Mason is still trying to get in to the concert. And we have the absolute weirdest interaction I've ever seen in my life where this really creepy goth chick comes up and sniffs him. And it's like, you smell like something. And he's like, when the fuck did rock stars need to take showers? And she's like, no, you smell like death. And I was like, that's weird. I don't like that. that. I don't like that at all. She's definitely sacrificed someone before. Right. How do you know what death smells like unless you spend time in it? Ooh. Right. Um, So then she goes to whisper to her equally creepy friend, and they decide to bring Mason in with them. Who are these people and why do they have the power to bring Mason in? No idea. Why? Why? Also, why 
do we have a weird group of super goth, creepy metal people coming to average man and his guitars rock concert? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's not like they're even the opening act. I mean, who knows? Maybe they are the opening act, but they're not the right type of music to be. Those the vibes, act. those vibes, so different. So okay. different. Like, do I listen to do I listen to both of those kinds of music? Absolutely. Do I ever think that I should listen to them in the same room? No. No. Absolutely not. Um, then we go back to George inside hanging out with Janine, who at this point, my note says she is clearly Kyle's ex-girlfriend. Mm-hmm. Yes. Because she is so bitter. But in the, I'm so cool and I'm just here to support him, kind of bitter. Right. (laughs) There is nothing I hate more than pick me girls. Like, do I have ex-boyfriends who um, are successful and I would fully go to their stuff and support them? Yes. Do I have ex-boyfriends that I might be a little bit bitter about their new situation? Yes. Are they the same person? No. No. Absolutely not. I take that back. There's one person that I would fully be Janine about, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't kill him or even want to. Fair. It's funny because we were just talking about it. Oops. Yeah. But again, not not quite the same. Not quite the same. Right. Right. Except for now I just realized that I don't know which of the two people that I was saying that about earlier you think I'm thinking about because I realized that there's two people we were talking about earlier that that could be true about. I think it's the latter. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. Great podcast content right now. Great podcast content. Basically, I am friends with all of the guys that I've ever been involved with. And sometimes that makes my life complicated. (laughs) Yes. And if if any of you are listening right now, hi, I'm not talking about you. (laughs) Or maybe she's talking about all of you. Um, New challenge. Figure out who I'm talking about right now. (laughs) For those of you who actually know me, take a wild guess. <laughs> You've got a few options. Um, then we go back to the church where uh, Daisy is confiding in the priest about what grim reapers are and her role on this earth in order to restore his face, faith in Jesus. Because this episode is all about telling the truth when you should not. When I mean, you absolutely should not. I will say... As much as I was like, why is everyone just telling the truth about everything that's unnecessary? I am glad that she restored his faith before she... Yes. I was not actually mad about people telling the truth when she did it. Yeah. It was then the fact that we immediately followed the scene of her telling the truth to the priest with the scene of Mason telling the truth to the creepy goth people. And then I was like, okay, we have gone too far. Yeah. Too far. I just... (sighs) But I feel like I'm just watching a different show because all these people are like, let me tell you the truth about everything. And it's like, no, you have never told the truth in your life. And now you're just like telling all the wrong people. I mean, the priest, whatever, but like the rest of them. I was like. (sighs) Yeah, no, um, Mason and his creepy goth friends. Also, unsurprised that Mason does it in order to make out with Chick. Yeah, that's not that's not surprising. Um, then we go back to the church where um, the priest is like freaking out because, you know, Jesus is back in his life because there are angels on earth or some shit. And then um, he realizes that there are teens doing it in the confessional. <sighs> Been there. Just kidding. They don't have confessionals in non-Catholic churches anyway. <laughs> um <laughs> Take that for what you will. Um, Anyway, the priest then chases them around the church to tell them about God being real in the form of Daisy Adair. 
which of course is the exact way you should handle that. You should chase people and terrify them to show them that Jesus is real. And then he trips over a candelabra, smacks his head, and drowns in the baptismal pool. That was the baptismal pool. I thought that was just holy water. Well, it it is holy water, but you can either fill like bottles of holy water or like in Catholic baptisms, they that stone pool of holy water is what they baptize kids in. Gotcha. Because in the Catholic Church, you have to be baptized as a baby. Right. Yes. Yes, I did know that. That makes sense because yes. we have like baptismal pools, like yes, big bathtubs. Yes, no, that that little tiny one. Haven't you ever seen the video of that one priest who was like dunking the child? <laughs> I have not. Oh my god, that's terrifying. The only thing I want to see. Yeah, no, it was um interesting. It was like an Eastern Orthodox priest, and he was like very violently baptizing that child. That's terrifying and probably hilarious. Correct. On both counts. Yes. Um then Do we have Daisy's moment then? She give when she gives him the cross. Yes. Yeah. So she decides that the priest needs the cross more than she does, and she puts it in the pool and escorts him on his merry way to crossing over. But she is still sad because he just got normal blue lights to cross over in, and there was no angels and cherubim and jesus and trumpets she was expecting which is weird because the other guy did get jesus yep so maybe the priest didn't really believe that well maybe so i don't know i don't either um then we go back to the concert where we meet kyle's new girlfriend who is a bitch and will not let george shake his hand and so she has to find a creative way to touch him to rape him, which is probably why VIP rapes are a little more tricky because most celebrities it, yeah. don't have free access to be touched. Right. Um, but she says that when you have to find a creative way to get to the person, it doesn't feel as much like a rape and it feels more like murder. Like you're plotting ways to yeah. find a way to touch them. And I was like, that. It's true. Like, there's a lot of times where you can kind of just pretend that your job isn't death. Yeah. But But also, like, though, I I also wrote this down because I feel like I was like, okay, that sounds right. And then I was like, you know what? It's still like, it still feels like they're saving them because in the end, they're going to die regardless. No, for sure. For sure. But I think it's the, the, the way you have to think about it and be yeah. creative about it feels more like plotting a murder. Yes. Oh, for sure. Yes, that for sure does. But I'm just like, it's just that much harder to save someone because you're yeah. not, I don't know. I like the idea of a reaper. I think it's nice. Yeah. I liked it better in Touched by an Angel, though, where it was angels. Mm-hmm. Because then it was helping people who are going to Jesus. But like... Yeah. Either way, I think that's why I like shows like that where like Medium or Touch My Angel or Dead Like Me, even though they're all kind of different ways of doing it. It's like, here's someone who will help you get it together before you go. Right. And like, wouldn't it be nice to have like Daisy help you over? It would. She's such a gem. She's such a sweetheart. And she like helps you find happiness and then leads you where you need to go. She's so good at her job. I know. If that's the way I'm going to go, that's fine. Yeah. Rube comes to pick Daisy up and kind of just gives her the, hey, kid, I know you're sad, but death is what it is. And we go when we're going to go and there's nothing we can really do about it. And he's, okay. and he's like, he's like, did you find what you were looking for? And she's like, nope. And she leaves. But also... In this conversation with Rube, starts talking about this Tower of Silence. Oh, yes. Yes, he does. very depressing. They just take bodies up to this tower in the middle of nowhere, it sounds like, where no one can get to them. And I'm so sorry. I don't, people running like a muck. And uh, 
he and then they just like let the birds eat them eat their bodies like i get the circle of life i i did watch the lion king a thousand times growing up i get it but that's kind of rough like i think in order for that to be a cultural part of something you have to be so in tune with the spirit being different than the body that like because it's also like it's interesting in thailand um everyone is cremated there is no burial they do not keep bodies because because they're a buddhist country they don't believe that your body really has any meaning once your soul is gone because then your soul is somewhere else so they don't like funerals are super intense religious temple experiences but they're not they don't have bodies involved so like it's a very different way of thinking about life than we in the western world do and i yeah. find it fascinating i just think that like it feels different whenever you put someone at the top of a tower to have their body eaten because even like we have body farms here and i think those are wonderful they like learn how to like study on them and obviously creatures yeah. eat on the bodies when they're there and whatever help them decompose so you can learn stuff about them yeah that's fine. I think specifically putting them at a top of a tower where no one goes, that's what but, you <laughs> see, but it's, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind, because like, if you had a body farm and people could see the vultures la- leaning on the, bo- like landing on the body, it would still kind of give you that, like that human t- need to protect yeah. a body. Whereas if it's on top of a tower where no one can see it, like, you know, in your mind that that's happening, but you don't have that, like that, uh, compassionate need to stop, mm-hmm. stop it from happening. Right. Well, I just want to make it very clear when I die, I am okay with going to a body farm. I'm okay with being planted to plant in the ground to be a tree. That's what I want. I want to be a tree. Yes. I am okay with these type of things. Please do not put my body in a tower to be devoured by vultures. Okay. That's all I ask. That's fair. Yes. I don't think that's legal in America. I would bet not. I'm pretty (laughs) sure it's a desecration of a human body. Yeah. So then we go back to the last women where Reggie and Phyllis have gone to the spot where George died because Reggie has never been there and they find joy there because joy apparently gets to mourn and Reggie doesn't. That made me upset. I was, I was upset thinking about it because then I, I remembered, I was like, joy doesn't have a job. But she leaves a lot while Reggie's at school, which means she's spending all this time mourning and trying to heal herself. And she's not made much of an effort other than that, like, one time that Reggie was put in therapy. Yeah. And, And, like, I get the concept of I'm not going to be helpful to you if I am not also healed. Right. But don't be mad at her for being in her grieving process if you have not given her the space to feel safe to grieve with you. Right. And if you can't. Because, I mean, you know, when you're grieving, sometimes you can't help others. You need yeah. your own space. That's fine. You have to find her another outlet. You are yes. her mother. That is yes. your job. Yes. Agreed. Um, but Phyllis is, of course, um, like, here we are. It's We all lost her. We are all allowed to feel things. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we go back to the concert where Mason is living his best wet dream. Having all of these people just um, fawn over and be obsessed with him and talk about death and why he is amazing. Then we go back to Kyle and George has snuck into the room alone to talk to him. And he's just like a regular guy who's like, I don't know why this is me. Yeah. Which kind, of, like, which kind of makes this even sadder. Because, like, if he was a douche, she would not be mad that he died. Right. But he's like, I don't know what how, how I got here. Mm-hmm. I just want to share my music with the world. It's not good music, but I'm going to share it. And I will say, this is another issue I have <laughs> with the show, is this should have been George's hardest reap to get into. And it was like butter getting through everything like she didn't have hold up getting from inside to outside i get that roxy was her police escort 
Yeah. But she had a very easy getting in. She immediately made friends with someone who could get her to the back room. And then she happened to see that he went into a room by himself. And I was like, that's not, I mean, the hardest thing was his girlfriend said, don't touch him. Like that's not very difficult. I feel like it's not, but it also, I think it kind of is symbolizing that George is in fact getting better at her job. Yeah. Like she, because, well, no, because they, the, all the other people made such a fuss about how she wasn't ready for this job. She wasn't good enough for this job. Yeah. And then it isn't hard for her. And I think that's kind of the point. I don't think it was executed okay. well, but I think that's yeah. kind of the point. I could see that. And I, I'm okay with that being the, the reasoning behind it. Because I mean, it is, even though she doesn't have any other character development, she does get better at her job over time. Yes. And that's, I mean, that's very clear. So, yeah. Um, and then Mason's exit from the goth people is my absolute favorite thing. He's like, you guys are all fucking crazy. I am not a reaper. I'm just a dude. You guys have a problem. You all need to get a tan except for you. You can stay pasty because you're gorgeous. And I was like, <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> right. <laughs> as a, as a very pale person, as I appreciate that. Person. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's actually why black is the only hair color I've never had because I had a black wig once in high school and I put it on and my dad was like, oh, oh, no, no, no. You look like death. You, you can't, you can't wear that. And I was like, it was during my twilight phase. So I was like, oh, right. I look so good. And he was like, you look like your dad. And I was like, that's the point. <laughs> I also, as a pasty person, um, the only the darkest i did dark brown with like mm-hmm. coffee brown highlights one time yeah and i really fit into my uh emo kid look yeah. for a, a solid six months at that because i was so pale and then i had dark hair and wore a lot of black i still wear a lot of black but uh it was yeah. not good for me so now i have a little a little bit of a lighter color in my hair to help bring out yeah i'm still very pale but yeah i probably don't look dead most of the time most of the time yeah um then my next note just says wow i did not see any of that coming because the way all of this death goes down is baffling i was very taken aback i agree because i was watching it and i was like my first thought was that like the stage lights were going to fall on him or yeah. something. That's how I thought he was going to die. And then I assumed one of the goth people was going to be Mason's Reap. And that's why he was with them the whole time. And I also, just before this scene, I put, Mason does always get his Reap in the end, no matter what. And then he doesn't. And I was like, I was like, you've, you've ruined me. I was like, yeah. and this didn't feel out of place, even though it wasn't following how he normally is like this is no. one of the things that wasn't normal but it felt like it was right at the no, right time. yeah and this was like one of the more dramatic deaths but not mm-hmm. often i think one of the problems is that often the deaths feel silly like they feel yes. like they're like holy shit didn't see that coming because it's like there's a zero percent chance i would have calculated all of those things happening this one just felt intense this season has had more. I mean, we had the gunshot, the gun scene or whatever. Yeah, at, yeah, yeah. Uh, the office building. I and mean, we've had more serious deaths in this season than prior. But I, I think it's also like it's one of the VIP deaths. And like you you don't hear about celebrities that died because mm-hmm. they tripped on a diving board. Like, right. you know, like when somebody that protected dies, it's something big. So I think I should have known, but yeah. I, I did not. Well, I definitely thought, I mean you know, if a stage light falls on you, that's going to be something people talk about. So that's why yeah. I thought it was something like that. Yeah. And like, whenever I saw the, I like, didn't believe it at first. <laughs> so I like, didn't believe what I was watching. Was right. Like, I thought I was imagining that she had a good one. <laughs> I was like, too. what? So ex-girlfriend Janine, who's super bitter, um, decides to kill Kyle. And um, then she is attempting to also kill his crazy new girlfriend, when Roxy steps in and does her job as a police officer and kills Janine. And yes. uh, Mason is fucked because he did not get Janine's soul before she was shot. And I just cannot believe any of that happened. I know. It shows. This is another part where, like, Mason's character development is that he 
he grows and he grows and he grows and he always does his job. And then he's kind of been on a downward spiral since season two started. And it's like, but it hasn't been obvious enough, I guess. It felt out of place how, how quickly it came back on. But this was like the height of him spiraling back downward. And it, it felt no, like it, it felt, it felt real. Like, I mean, he's been, yeah. his, all of his deaths in season two have been really emotionally triggering for him. Mm-hmm. And he's been, trying to escape how real he feels like death is and so he finally like and like we know he loves the idea of being a rock star last week he reaped his favorite rock star like he's have yeah he's like on this thing where like everything is too real and he finally broke yep and so that that did feel his and daisy's arcs this season have not been or have been very well done yeah, I don't. I don't think I feel the same way about anybody else's, but those two. Do not. Um, and I feel like that's good because I feel like Mason's arc last season was so chaotic, and it was like yes. it tried to do last season what it's been doing this season. It, his his arc in season one, hit. his arc in season one wasn't an arc; it was a scatter plot. Exactly, it was like they wanted to make you feel these certain ways about them, and then they just like take it all away from you. And it was like, well, that was all pointless. All of that building was pointless. Yeah. Um. Then we go back to the last woman where Phyllis is saying the shit that somebody needed to say to Joy ages ago. Yes. She said, is this when she said that she was not the girl Clancy was sleeping with? Yes. Yeah. She's like, I'm not the girl Clancy is sleeping with. So you need to stop taking it out on me. I was like, I know. And but and she basically is like calling her out on her bullshit with her marriage, on her bullshit with not putting Reggie's needs into the picture at all. Whew. It was rough. It yeah. was needed, but it was rough. Yeah. And then Joy says that uh after all of this, she's got her respected ritual of chunky monkey because she's like, let's get ice cream. And then they have this whole big thing, and then Reggie walks in. Do you have a favorite Ben and Jerry's? I do. Um, It is the uh, cheesecake core that has the two different chocolate chip cookie ice creams with the cheesecake in the middle. Nice. I go back and forth between half-baked and half-baked Froyo. Those are my go-tos. Nice. Um, Then we go back to the Waffle House. Where Roxy is struggling emotionally with the fact that she actually like shot somebody. Mm-hmm. Rube's like, because you're good at your job, both of them. Like, it's okay. You're you got this. And then we find out that Kiffany is in love with Rube. Just kidding. That's my own head canon based on how much she saves pie for him. Yes. And um that's fine. But during and- this scene with Kiffany, I have another question about her. I don't know what she knows and it bothers me (laughs) because like she said she comes up and she says did somebody die tonight like she knows what's going on oh no 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 she looked out the window and saw the vigil with all the candles oh and that's that part and that's when she said did somebody die tonight oh no she saw the people with the candlelight that makes way more sense because I must have been writing something down and when I looked up she was saying that and I was like does she know like is she just like like, yeah because um I don't, I think I missed the moment where George takes Kyle outside Mm -hmm. and show and he sees all of the candles and everything. And he's like, what is this for? And she's like, it's for you. And then we go to the diner and we see that the vigil is like taking over the whole city. And so Kevin, sees the candles and was like, whoa, did somebody die tonight? And he's like, and Drew's like every day. Right. And um, then and then we're standing outside of the Waffle House and Daisy walks up to Mason and Mason is like, I can't go in there. I can't face Rube because he knows he fucked up with the thing. And he's like, everybody always thinks I'm a fuck up. I can't do it. And Daisy kisses him. She says, don't, don't take that for more than it is. Yeah. She said, don't read and like, don't take that for more than what it is. And he was like, I, I won't. And I was, but I was like, I will. I will. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so i will say i have one last okay. note 
Because then they go, oh, is this about that moment? This is about that moment. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so I've obviously been waiting for this moment for a while, and I'm pleased that it happened, but I wish there would have been more recent buildup to it. Because the last episode we saw with Mason and Daisy being like on the same page about stuff was when they were at Rube's apartment. And then we kind of left that storyline for a few episodes and it's okay to like leave it and come back to it. But I just, I wanted to, you know how like you get the butterflies before going on like a first date or something. I wanted to have the butterflies before the kiss and it was just like so sudden. And so yeah. I was like, here's your immediate satisfaction of what you wanted. It's like, great. But if you would have just added in a little more before, it would have hit so much harder for me. Yeah, I feel that. Um, yeah. But then they go inside, basically, with her kiss, you know, has the courage to go inside. And he goes inside and immediately just starts apologizing. And then George enters and everyone's complimenting her outfit. And she's like, yeah, Roxy picked it out. And Rube's like, Roxy? And he, she goes, under this uniform, I'm all woman. And I died. But they were just like, I re- my last note is just like, I love their little family. Like at the end of the day, no matter how much they hate each other, like when things are tough and people are feeling things, they are family. Right. And that is beautiful. It is beautiful. <sighs> there was no trivia for this episode. Wait. Wait. Oh, you have another note. Oh, sorry. I have one more note that you have missed out on. George's last monologue is talking about how she's such an average person and average people don't get candlelight vigils. And then it flashes over to where she died and her mom and Phyllis and Reggie had lit candles. Oh, yes. And it was, she did get her candlelight vigil, even though she's just an average person. That's true. I did forget that. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. Um, But yeah, like I said, there's no trivia for this episode. Um, Shame. I love some trivia. I know. Um, do you want to punch anyone today? Absolutely. That was fantastic. Um, I would like to punch Janine because she's a jerk. Yeah. Yeah, she sure and is. Nothing good about her. No. I think I would like to punch Bandar. Fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, just because I feel like someone should have punched him a long time ago. That is fair. I'm okay with that. Um, who is your uh, MVP? Mason. <laughs> is it ever not Mason? Yes, sometimes. Next week it's not Mason. <laughs> uh, I just love him so much. And he just, he hit his peak. And it's just his whole world came crashing down in that moment and I just felt so bad for him and he does screw up a lot but he really does try his best a lot yeah and he wants to do things right he just doesn't and my MVP is Phyllis because she says the things to Joy that I've been trying to say to Joy through my TV screen for two seasons yes yes that's fair yeah so um any last thoughts? I thought you were going to ask me about any last words. I was like, <laughs> yes, any last words? Not today. Um, no, I am. Um, I'm interested to see how the season ends because things are changing, and it's too late to change a show. I feel yeah. like so. I'm, I'm interested to see what they're going to do with the next few episodes and how they're going to end it especially since there's a movie that comes out later. I feel like that means they didn't end it. Right. So. All right. Well, if you have thoughts on Mason and Daisy finally kissing, if you have ideas about how Bandar cannot be so pale anymore, um, or on how you think this season is going to end, you can message us on any of the social medias at Death and Aliens. And you can follow me and message me at Death and Aliens. Nope, that's my podcast, also, not me. That's not me. Get an email. Message yeah. her there. Yeah, perfect. Um, but me personally at E-M-K-A-Y underscore superstar. And you can find me everywhere at C-E Cloud 13. And we will see you later this week. Bye. Bye.